Hello, I'm Walter Shapiro, uh, staff writer for The New Republic, who will be moderating this panel. I just want to say that it is a panel filled with people who displayed the kind of political courage I wish I would have the gumption to display in similar fashion. S since time is limited, let me keep the introductions really brief. Um, on my right um, is veteran Republican consultant Stuart Stevens, who was a top advisor to the 2012 Mitt Romney campaign, and a man who has a book out this week called The Conspiracy to End America, Five Ways My Party is Driving Our Democracy. And judging from the excerpt I read in the LA Times, it's going to be terrific. Um, next, to her, next to him is Tara Sedmeyer, who is a senior advisor uh, for the Lincoln Project, um, and much more importantly, someone who's, who did her apprenticeship working for a Republican congressman on the Hill um, and is also um, a TV commentator. And at the end is a fellow by the name of George Conway, um, who I was probably the only person to follow on Twitter during the Trump years. Um, it was a very obscure account. Uh, and he's a, vet, a, a leading Washington lawyer and litigator um, and um, a courageous person in his own right. Since time is limited, let me just start off by asking each of you a question that could be answered in an hour and a half, but I, would, I will opt for the shorter version. When was the moment you realized that the, your break with the Republican Party was permanent and that this was not just a Rockefeller Republican reacting to the nomination of Barry Goldwater or George Meany at the AFL-CIO reacting to the nomination of George McGovern in 72. Why don't I start with you, Stuart? Um, actually, I can uh, target this to a very specific date. I think it was December 15th. Uh, 2015 when Trump came out with the Muslim ban and the party went along with it. And if the party stands for anything, it's supposed to be the Constitution and what is a Muslim test but a religious ban? How do you know if somebody's a Muslim? You have to ask them if there's a, you know, it's a religious test. So when the party didn't say anything then, um, I thought it was lost in that moment. Tara? Well, for me, I hung on a little longer, even though I was one of the uh, first never Trump Republican voices in the in media space. And I thought that the country would come to its senses and the party would never allow someone with this level of ignorance and buffoonery to be our nominee. I said, nah, no way. Well, I was wrong, um, uh, as were many of us. So I thought that I would be able to make a difference from the inside, calling out the hypocrisy, calling out the the uh, uh, level of, of um, craven political expediency that a lot of the Republicans were, were engaging in to rationalize Trump. But there were two inflection points for me. The first time I almost left the party was after Charlottesville, um, when there, you know, there's good people on both sides, and I saw Republicans rationalize that. But my good friend Michael Steele, former RNC chair, said, no, 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 don't let them run you out. They need people like us to hold them accountable. I said, all right, I'll try. So I did for the next couple of years, and there were just so many things that were so offensive, and I saw the, the direction the country was going in, and I saw every opportunity Republicans had to redeem themselves and repudiate Trump. They did not. The final straw for me was election night, uh, 2020. And when Donald Trump went out into the East Room of the White House and claimed election fraud and undermined one of the most fundamental cornerstones of our Constitution and Republican leadership allowed him to get away with it, at that point I said there is absolutely nothing sacred to the Republican Party anymore. Everything that I thought and believed the Republicans stood for was obviously BS, I'm out. I could no longer rationalize staying in a party that had this level of rot. And then obviously January 6th, as the granddaughter of a police captain from Paramus, New Jersey, where I proudly grew up, the wife of a federal law enforcement officer, January 6th just reinforced the decision I made. And that's the day that I made the decision that I wanted to see the Republican Party burn to the ground so that we could start something else. Because it does not deserve to be a legitimate party in this country anymore. It's really interesting to hear you describe your story because it's more like you were up here 
and then you went like that. Right. I was kind of like this. I didn't quite get it for a while until, you know, through 2017. What is wrong with this guy? What is wrong with this guy? I remember. You get it right? No, no, we talked yeah, about we're, it. We're, we're George, could friends. you just lift up your mic a little bit? Yeah, we talked about that. And, and it wasn't, I mean, on, in March of 2018, is, that was when I registered as an independent in New Jersey, and, you know, unaffiliated voters, right. what they call it. And right then, my, my reasoning was this party has become a personality cult. And it wasn't even that bad in 2018 compared to today. That's the funny thing about it. So it's funny. It's just weird. It's just funny. Like you, you were there first, yeah. and but but I I, I decided that the, the, the got to burn the bridges with the Republican Party sooner, because I just felt that it just I couldn't believe the thing about being incoherent here. But <laughs> the thing about Trump was I thought, okay, he's not great. He's bad in a lot of ways, but he'll be controlled by a structure around him, whether it be the White House staff, the Congress, the party. And that totally fell apart in 2017. And that was the point at which, you know, it was glacial over 2017. By 2018, I said, forget it. Well, in 2017 is when he tried to, you know, when he fired Comey, he had the Russians in the White House. Yeah. No, but those, Charlottesville. But I mean, all of those things were then. like, <laughs> it, 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 were, were, were what led me to like, yeah. what is going on here? What is wrong with him? And, yeah. and I realized he, the guy's in, irredeemable. I, I think we have all established that the adults in the room theory will not hold water. Yeah. No. Uh, but no. since time is limited. There have to be adults in the room. Yeah. There weren't any. Uh, but since time is limited, let me ask probably the most important question. Uh, which is, both, all three of you coming out of Republican pedigrees, what do you get about running against Trump in 2024, the Democrats coming out of a different mindset and a different history don't get? Um, if, if I ran the Democratic Party, God help us, but if I did, um, I would uh, start talking about Joe Biden as being a great president. Um, I, I don't know why they sort of negotiate against themselves and say he's been a good president. Or I, and I, I, what, what drives me crazy about the Democratic Party is like why they can't get behind their guy. So what? A couple of years ago, they had a, a Biden gave a State of the Union, and two Democrats gave an alternative State of the Union. It was like, what are you doing? Um, so um, I, I think. Uh, the Biden campaign is, is a very competent organization. I think they ran a brilliant campaign in 2020. It's very hard to beat an incumbent president. I know. I've tried. I've failed. Um, and I have a lot of confidence in them. But this is going to be a Biden or Trump. So be for Biden and be for him all the way and be thankful that he's there. The guy's saving the world in Ukraine and Israel. So, I, I, I just, I would try to tell the Democratic Party, I actually wrote a piece about this for, you know, walk with a little swagger. You know, there's more of you than there are of them. And take the attitude, we're right, they're wrong. And don't, don't try to, you don't, you don't need to try to understand the guy in the Camp All Switch sweatshirt in the Capitol. It doesn't matter. And you are the majority, act like the majority, it's your country, and act like that. Have a little swagger. So. Yeah, that's something that Republicans are very good at. And so uh, I'm very proud of the work that we do with the Lincoln Projects. Stu and I are colleagues there, and we're grateful for you guys showing our, some of our ads. Thank you to Michelle Kinney, she's part of our creative team. She's the creative director here. Um, we as former Republicans now, but we understand the playbook. And what I would say on to, in, in, as a compliment to what Stu said is that you have to play the game that you're in. You can't play a game from 20 years ago, 10 years ago, politically that you wish it was like. It's not like that anymore. You, it's not, you have to be, because if you don't, you'll get run over. And oftentimes Democrats, you know, and God bless my Democratic friends, but you lead with your hearts sometimes and, you know, and we can't do that, right? You say Republicans fall in line, Democrats have to fall in love. Those days are over, okay? Um, it's a binary choice. It is America, which is Joe Biden and what D Democrats are doing, protecting our democracy, or Trump. 
and Trumpism. That's it. That's the choice. It's not marginal tax rates. It's not, you know, health care. It's not, look, all of those things we can argue with later, but none of that matters if we don't have a democratic republic system of freedom to maintain what we have here in America. None of that matters. You cannot bring a policy pen to a political gun, gun fight. You cannot. So that's where we come in as former Republicans to be the tip of the spear, to tell everyone, it's all right, you can come with us on the front lines and fight this because our democracy is worth fighting for. Being here in this venue and what this represents here at Cooper Union, the Great Hall, the history here, it's extraordinary. We need to remember what we did in this country, what we have fought through in the past, those types of forces to get here and embrace that. Embrace that messaging to remember what America stands for, warts and all, it's okay. My hero, Ida B. Wells, said to, to right the wrongs, you have to shine the light of truth upon them. And that's what we need to do, expose. Don't be afraid to hold them accountable and remember why we fight. There are more of us than there are of them. As long as we collectively have that anger and remember what the, keep the eye on the prize, which is protecting democracy at all costs and Joe Biden, is the man to help us do that. Well, I'm gonna come at this from a completely different approach. I think you have to wage psychological war on Donald Trump. He is losing it, okay? I mean, we've always said, oh, he's not, not there, he's losing it, but he really, really is losing it now. He is, in the way that malignant narcissists do at the very end, when the Russians are two, are two blocks away and you're in the, in the, in the, in the bunker, okay? So he, I, I think you guys need to do more of these audience of one ads that go directly at his psyche and drive him nuts. And then you, you just, it's an it's a endless cycle. It's an, you, 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 he, you will create more film of him acting like a lunatic, not, not that there isn't enough already, but you're, it's going to get more and more attention now as the campaign uh, progresses. Things that he says will get more attention. I don't think that Democrats have ever attacked Trump enough. I don't think, I really think that they, they, their view is, oh, let's just let him, you, you don't want to get into the muck with him. No, you, you do have to get in the muck with him because you have to show everybody who he is. Not because you're going to convince the 30% of the electorate that is MAGA, but, you know, the people in the middle, which was the object of the Lincoln Project to begin with. You have to remember that you have, the people who are going to go out, if, if you ask people who are they going to vote for, you'll get kind of these close horse race numbers, but if you actually focus on who's going to crawl on broken glass to vote for or against Trump, the people who are going to crawl on broken glass are you people, okay? Not the MAGA types. In fact, there was this, this, um, this analysis done by Club for Growth, the, the, the conservative, uh, right, the right-wing organization that, that, that's the PAC um, by, by, by um, McIntosh, they wrote a memo and they, did, they conducted polling about what, polling and, and research about what, how ads attacking Trump affected the MAGA people. And basically, it didn't affect his support, but it did affect their enthusiasm. And that's the thing, it's like you have to show this guy is completely off his wa wa rocker and that you're gonna be, if you're already exhausted by him, wait till he gets back. And I think one of the problems we have right now is he hasn't gotten enough attention. I know everybody says, oh, we give him too much attention. He has not gotten enough attention. Ever since he got kicked off, the, kicked off Twitter and, and Facebook and Instagram, and, and not Instagram, but and, and out of the White House, we haven't seen the full crazy the way we did. And now the crazy, he's crazy squared now. Just to back that up, so for Lincoln Project, we have an ad called Suckers because we saw that there, were, there was one thing, George, that moved people just a little bit on the MAGA side. Obviously, that's not our target audience, but it was the idea of them being ripped off. So when Donald Trump was soliciting legal, you know, money for his legal fees, then people were like, wait a minute, he's taking our money every month? We only wanted one donation. They didn't like that. So every time now we rerun suckers to remind them that 
uh, hello, <laughs> you know, this is what you guys are dealing with here. So it's one example of where we did that. But for us at the Lincoln Project, we target something called the Bannon Line, which was named after, yes, Steve Bannon. But um, he said it in 2020, if, you, if between four and 7% of Republicans do not vote for Donald Trump, he'll lose. So we said, hold our beer. So we went after that four to 7%, and we believe now since Dobbs, and all this other stuff that's going on, but particularly Dobbs, that that range has expanded to between 7 and 11% now. There's a larger pool of gettable, independent, right-leaning, or possibly Republic, you know, Republicans that we can target because they are exhausted with this. They recognize the guy's insane. They are no longer giving him the benefit of the doubt. And, you know, the tax cuts may not be worth it anymore. So we are making sure that that's who we target because... You know, other folks have their other demographics, but that's where it's going to be won. This election is going to be won in five or six states. It came really close last time, closer than anyone really realizes, and we certainly don't want it to be that close again, but it most likely will. And those, it's a, it's a game of numbers. So it's important that we energize and explain to people what is at stake here. I just want to ask Stuart in particular a question. Do you think there's any reasonable chance that Trump doesn't get the Republican nomination? No, no. no. <laughs> you, have to, you have to get inside their head, right? It, it's, it's sort of like crop circles. Once you understand them, it all makes sense. <laughs> so Donald Trump is pre was elected president of the United States. Everybody knows that. So we have an illegal president, which means we live in an occupied country. So Trump is so threatening to them deep state, whatever, that they stole the election from him. And now that he wants to run again, they're trying to put him in jail. So how can you allow this to happen? Every time, he, that's why he goes up every time he's indicted. It's just further proof that the only way they think they can stop our guy is through extra uh, electoral means. So Trump will be Trump is what the Republican Party wants to be. I mean, this is something, you know, I wrote this book called It Was All a Lie, and this idea that somehow Trump hijacked the party. Trump, Trump didn't change the party. Trump revealed the party. And it's, 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 a, it's a really difficult thing for a lot of us who worked in the party, but... Um, you know, the conclusion I came to, which I, to me seemed to be the only intellectually honest way, was all of these things that we put out as values, uh, character counts, personal responsibility, strong on Russia, Soviet Union, the deficit matters. All of these things weren't values, they were just marketing slogans. Because why else would you abandon them? People don't abandon deeply held beliefs in a couple of years. So, you know, Trump had this sort of animal instinct that understood that, if he, that the party really didn't believe in anything except power, and if he could give the party power, they would, a, a guy that talks in public about having sex with his daughter could be the Republican nominee. What's the problem? And he was right. Um, and it's never going to change. There's not some line that can cross. I mean, you know, they had a chance to vote to convict Trump. Trump organized and sent uh, a mob. I mean, think about it. If someone organizes and sends people into your workplace to kill you, and you still won't vote to convict him, you think there's some principle he's going to cross that's going to make you say, well, I don't know, you know. I mean, okay, tried to kill us. Um, so Trump is what the party wants to be. It's become a white grievance party. 85% of Trump's coalition is white. And it's sort of a different discussion, but in many ways this is all about race. The Republican Party understands that the country is becoming rapidly a minority-majority country. Those 16 years and under, the majority of Americans are non-white. The odds that they'll be non-white when they're 18 is like exceedingly high. <laughs> and the party understands that. So that's why they're so desperate to change the rules of voting, so they can sort of curate the election. Um, and it's, uh, you know, I, I, I think we would be foolish to say that uh, they can't win. And one of the things when democracy, I mean, I wrote this book about it, when democracies go into autocracies, one of the key elements is those who support democracy can't imagine it happening. And the inability to imagine Trump, I think personally, I, I mean, a lot of people are wrong about Trump in 2016, but I think I was probably the most wrong. 
I didn't think he'd win the nomination. I didn't think he'd win the general. But the inability to imagine Trump has always helped Trump. I think that helped him win in 2016. I think Clinton left a lot of votes on the table to just assume she'd win. And the inability to imagine that Trump would, if he lost by seven and a half million votes, would refuse to accept the results, that's, that's benefited Trump. And we should allow for that. I mean, the problem with the unimaginable is it's hard to imagine. And that's the question we have to ask ourselves. And I, I, one of the, I think one of the difficulties now is how to talk about this. It's sort of like a, a serious pandemic. Whatever you say at the beginning will sound alarmist, but at the end will prove inadequate. And I think struggling with this language of how to talk about it without sounding alarmist or crazy. But I mean, I, I believe this completely. I mean, I, I know these people as bad as you think they are. They're worse. Jason Miller was my intern. God help me. I went um, to college with him. We were college Republicans it, together. It, it, if Donald Trump is elected or a Trump wannabe like DeSantis, I think it'll be the last election that we can recognize as anything we've had in America. Let me end by asking, um, for want of a, feeling like a debate mod, a bad debate moderator, um, uh, saying things like, well, it's time to move we'll on. Raise our hands. Um, and <laughs> raising hands. Well, let's go with the lightning round. Um, just, just a quick answer. Uh, Biden, at the end of September, made a major speech on democracy at the uh, John McCain Center in Tempe, Arizona. I just want your quick reaction to all of you about, is this the right way to run after Trump? 100%. Joe Biden gave the speech of his career on democracy that I don't think got enough attention. And that has to be the framework. And to juxtapose that where he was in the John McCain Center, giving that speech with the Ku Caucus in the GOP throwing out their speaker and throwing our Congress into, into chaos, I think that, to George's point, there needs to be more attention paid to the contrast and Democrats need to embrace that. So absolutely fantastic job between that and his speech on supporting Israel. Joe Biden is really, really showing us why he deserves to be reelected, unequivocally. Yeah, I totally agree with that. I think he needs to talk about democracy and he needs to talk about the rule of law more. Um, it's tricky right now because of the cases against Trump. He has to, Biden has to stand back from mm -hmm. those, those cases. Um, lest he play into the uh, paranoid um, lying of the of the defense team, but I do think it, it's important to 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 show to be aspirational about what this country can be and what it can you know how we resolve our differences because that's what unites us all. What unites us all is that we 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 vote and then we accept the results, and we believe in free speech and we believe in government for everyone, not just for people to advantage themselves personally. Now, yeah, that may turn out that that has implications from a liberal standpoint and from a conservative standpoint, but all of these things that bring us together, the better angels of our nature, th th those things need to be emphasized more at the same time that you whack the hell out of them. The one thing I'll just say, is, um, the one thing I know, having done a million campaigns is, if you want voters to care about something, you have to care about it. And I think that democracy is on the ballot. I don't buy, when people, all these people say it's gonna be about gas prices or about inflation or about this or that. It will be if you allow it to be, but it doesn't have to be. And I think one of the reasons that Biden and the Democrats did so well in the off year was putting democracy on the ballot. And that's what this race should is about, so you should talk about it, and I think what the campaign, Biden campaign is doing is dead on. Anyway, that's a wonderful spot to stop. I could have gone on with this panel for another hour, but I could see a large hook coming down from the ceiling. So I just want to thank uh, Stuart, Tara, and George for this, and thank you.